It's uh, a great privilege to be here to, to tell you about the work that I'm doing um, in concert with the JGI. I gave a, a really vague and, and broad title that could basically cover anything in evolutionary biology. And um, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to talk about when I was agreed to come here, but um, that one of the main things I'm doing with the JGI is this um, single cell genomics project. And so um, I've kind of decided I'll just, I'll just focus on that because it's, a, it's a, a single story and hopefully you'll find it at least um, interesting. So dark matter um, is a term that's been thrown around a lot in microbial circles and dark matter microbes. Um, and as mycologists, we really um, embrace this term because we're really into sort of creepy and dark things. And um, two points that really make fungi a kind of dark matter. One is that um, we don't know very much about the morphology and function of most fungi, actually. And another is that we don't know what they look like at all because we have this great divide between what we expect to be there and um, you have some estimates of maybe 1.5 million fungal species and that's probably pretty low. Um, but we've only described 100,000 of them. And, um, and so w a lot of them we don't know what they look like or even have DNA sequences of them sort of the best uh, environmental DNA survey of all um, fungal, you know, habitats was a soil metabarcoding study led by Teeter Su, and, and they detected um, 44,000 species, but only 4,400 of them overlapped with the known um, diversity. So it really highlights how little we know about um, real fungi and their morphology. And if we were to have like culture, done a culturing study, like a single culturing study, we'd, we'd actually get very few fungi culturing soil, depending on the method. So, so in reality, um, most fungi out there are on sort of the dark side of the moon, and they're, they're what we're calling dark matter fungi. So why should we use this single cell approach to look at fungal diversity? First, let's, let's talk about what this approach is all about. It's very simple. Let's say we have a, a complex sample. We know there's a bunch of different uh, genotypes or species in it. And we can isolate individual cells uh, however we might want to. And then, and then we take the individual cell and we lyse it and we get the DNA out of that one cell and we use um, what's called whole genome amplification, okay? So we basically get working amounts of DNA from a single cell. And that's typically done with um, viral polymerase and um, it's often called multi-displacement amplification. It's not, uh, um, it's not as biased as, well, and actually that's not totally true. There's, uh, you could also do it by PCR, but we are mostly focusing on this um, viral polymerase type of amplification. So we get enough DNA and then we can um, do shotgun sequencing and then assemble it into a, a single cell genome to the best extent we can. And you know, the, the reason we want to do this is because if we're, you know, we're using culturing, we're not going to get at a lot of these fungi because they're presumably unculturable. Um, if we were to use metagenomic approaches, we wouldn't be able to sort of group the genes that we get from sequencing in that way into genomes, okay? So this, the goal here is to, is to create a genome. And um, it also, because of, of the ability to separate cells by flow cytometry, we can scale this up to a very large extent. Okay. However, um, single cell genomics does not give um, this snout to tail uh, coverage of genome data. You know, as you know, in, in, in um, the culinary world, there's this big emphasis now on using the, the whole animal. And, um, and we, as genomicists, are actually really wasteful about the data we could possibly get. And uh, my lab has been just as bad as any. Um, sometimes we would um, sequence a genome, and get the microsatellites out, and then throw the rest away. And um, there's all this data that's just kind of going into the rubbish bin. Um, we don't have that privilege with single cell genomics. We're just getting some prime cuts and then uh, the rest is inaccessible to us. Uh, 
ideally we want to get at this gene space, okay? So what are the genes, the types of genes that are found in this genome and what can that tell us about the metabolic potential of those genomes? Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about how we can get a few other, other pieces of this, of this uh, genome space out through single cell methods. So the story that uh, I'm going to tell starts uh, back in 2006 with this really obscure fungus um, called rosella, and I'm calling it the least fun guy in the room uh, because it's not very fungal, and I'll explain that right now. Um, you never heard of it because uh, it just attacks w water molds, and so, um, you know, it doesn't do anything economically interesting. Uh, but it's an endoparasite of these water molds, and when it gets inside the cell, it grows there um, without a cell wall. So that's really not a very fungal kind of characteristic. Most fungi are digesting things across a chitinous cell wall. Um, and, but rosella also produces these, these cool um, zoospores, so it had kind of long been considered a kind of chytrid fungus. So like this amphibian disease fungus that many of you have heard of. So another non-fungal thing that it seems to do is phagocytose the host cytoplasm. So it doesn't have a cell wall when it's growing inside the host that gives it the potential to phag phagocytose. Again, a very non-fungal thing. And here's some cool micrographs by Martha Powell looking at rosella and you can, at this point in this, in this um, cell cycle, the, the, the host is mostly gone, and you can tell the parasite from the host on the basis of their mitochondria, which are very different. But presumably these parasitophorous vacuoles have been basically endocytosed by the uh, fungus, and then these, these dark things lining the vacuole are the host mitochondria. So another interesting thing about the rosella biology is that it, um, it seems to be attracting the, the mitochondria to the parasite interface, and it also has these ATP transporters. So it seems likely that it's keeping the host mitochondria alive so that and near to its interface so it can draw off ATP from, from the host. And it's taken those um, ATP transporters through horizontal um, acquisition from chlamydia bacteria. Okay, so that's Rosella. And I, I, I was a, a postdoc with Redis Vilgelis uh, in 2006, and we were analyzing the fungal tree of life, and it, you know, Rosella, which was supposed to be just a chytrid fungus, turned out to be on this first branch of the fungal tree of life, okay? And that um, put it with this other really obscure uh, endoparasitic group, the microsporidia. So they were, they were, um, very divergent. And were, were it not for this discovery that I'm going to talk about, I, Rosella would have just been sort of like the Amborella of the fungal kingdom, so a lonely basal lineage. But it turned out that um, if you, once, once people started sequencing environmental data and looking at um, these, these sequences, you could start to see tons of, of, of things related to Rosella in, in the environment, okay? And here's a tree, there's a, the fungal clade here, and then here's this group that is now known as Cryptomycota or Rosellomycota, and in this red here is Rosella. So there's all these environmental sequences that are related to Rosella out there. The kind of habitats we're talking about are, well, pretty much everything, um, highly common in aquatic, marine, um, even terrestrial soils. Um, anoxic habitats are very good for finding these, these organisms. So this is our quintessential dark matter, and we didn't know, uh, we know very little about what these, oops, sorry, these taxa do, okay? And it's with that in mind that um, Igor Grigorev approached me, kind of encouraging me to write this CSP to tackle this problem using single cell genomics. Okay, and so this is the title of our, of our um, project, and we're mostly looking at freshwater ecosystems. Ideally, we want to sequence 50 uh, environmental species with four cells of each, and then use metatranscriptomics to um, bolster the gene models. 
And um, these are the, the, the lead investigators here. And, and really, this work that I'm going to be talking about next has is, is been done uh, by JGI largely, and, um, and particularly Stephen Arndt and Joyna Chobano have done a lot of the um, bench work and analysis, so they deserve the credit here. Okay, so that's the broad goals of our project, but going back maybe a couple years before we put the CSP together, we were doing what I guess JGI calls R&D, so I was helping them um, with developing single cell genomics as a capacity at JGI, and we're still working on this. Uh, what we did is we took eight species where we could get a lot of material. They're unculturable fungi. They're mostly mycoparasites, um, like our rosella. Um, this is a chytrid that parasitizes sordaria. We also had a daphnia parasite, and then this pollen uh, chytrid, sapor saprophytic, um, all, all unculturable as far as we can get to do in the lab. But now you can see we can get a lot of spores of these parasites, and now we have a lot of material to play with, and so we're using those as sort of uh, test organisms to develop this pipeline. And I'm just going to go through three lessons we learned during this R&D phase. One lesson is that um, we need to monitor in real time the multi-displacement amplification, so the genome amplification step. If we look at that as it's happening in real time, we can see how good that's occurring. So you can use like a qPCR machine and you look at the accumulation of DNA by the synthesis reaction. And what uh, Doina did here in this, in this run, um, she's got some controls which are blue and red, and then she's got um, 100 cells in a single well, and then she's got uh, one cell in a bunch of wells, okay? So these, these purple lines are individual wells, and you can see them start to take off and then, you know, saturate eventually. And you can see that more cells you put in a well, the more amplification you get, which makes perfect sense. Okay, so monitoring those reactions, we now can use this metric of start time. So when does the reaction start to take off? And that will tell us how good the, um, the amplification step will be. And so this is the start time of the reaction, and then this is genome completeness, okay? So how, how much of that target genome we were able to get out of the reaction. And you can see this strong negative correlation here. Each one of these dots is a different um, library, and we have the eight species here, and then the different sizes and number of cells we put in, okay? It's, it's, it's a strong correlation, but it's certainly not perfect. Another lesson we learned is that after you make these, after you do these amplification steps, you can actually tell how good the, the amplification went, how biased it is by doing shallow sequencing. And so, um, What's shown here is you, you basically take the library or you take the amplification, you make a, a MySeq library and you run, you know, a few million reads there, and then you look at the uniqueness of 20 base pair um, words, okay? And if your library is really biased, then you're not going to have high uniqueness, but if you have high uniqueness, it means, you know, you're covering a lot of the genome, okay? And so if, a li if, if this shallow sequencing showed high uniqueness, we're likely to be able to get a complete genome when we, when we do the full-on sequencing with, with HiSeq. Um, okay. And then development three is that if we can get individual cells in, in different tubes, amplify them separately, and then sequence them separately, combine the reads together and co-assemble them, we're going to get a really good um, outcome. And presumably, there's like a lot of stochastic processes happening in an individual well, such that by um, combining multiple cells, we're averaging out that stochasticity. So uh, here's just assembly size and then genome completeness. The, the, uh, there's the same eight species here. And now we're showing the co-assembled uh, genomes. And those are these crossed circles. And they're always better than um, the the individual libraries, as you might imagine. So that's the approach we'd love to take. And unfortunately, well, you, it's very hard to do in nature when you have high diversity samples. But in practice, it's, it's very useful. Okay, uh, so we had those eight species. 
And we then were um, looking to see if we could grow the tree of life using them. And that turned out to be actually really straightforward. Um, we were able to put our uh, single cell genomes into the tree. These, that's these purple, um, purple genomes here. In some cases, we had reference uh, assemblies based off DNA that we would be able to get a lot of, like colochytrium and rosella. So no problem placing them in the tree. Uh, what you can see here is the, this bar chart is showing completeness. And the yellow bar is the best completed uh, single cell library. And that's, you know, that's hovering around the 50 to maybe 80% genome coverage from one single cell. And then um, the co-assembly is this red bar here, so we can get, uh, you know, up to 95% genome completeness estimated. Probably it's even better than that. Okay, but these organisms vary a lot in their assembly size and gene counts. But the important thing is how complete the genome is assembled. So we now have this uh, sing single cell genome sequencing pipeline developed. And it basically goes like this. We take a sample, we fractionate it by filtration. We're generally going for this size range, um, which has a lot of chytrid spores in it. Then we, we screen a bunch of samples to know which one has the most target. We're using like universal 18S primers. And then we use flow cytometry to isolate single cells. Typically, it's been either just D DNA as a stain, but it could be chitin or it could be tubulin. Uh, then the real-time MDA. Then if it amplifies, uh, if, the, if we get good wells, we'll sequence them the by Sanger sequencing PCR 18S. We can skip that step altogether and go straight to MySeq potentially, um, which we are looking at the random 20 mer uniqueness, low levels of contamination, bacteria are always a problem. And then we co-assemble uh, three or more cells if we have that luxury using spades. And then, um, and then our genome completeness is estimated using Segma. And this is just a, showing how that program is actually not dead yet for us. Um, even though Ian Corf's lab doesn't want to support it anymore, we found it actually pretty indispensable. So I hope he'll change his mind. So this is just essentially looking at some really highly conserved eukaryotic genes and how many of those can we find in that genome assembly. And then that tells us how complete our genome is. All right. So this is the, the, the first place where we've turned our attention to try to get some of these environmental um, dark matter fungi sequenced. And it's a really lovely place, oops, sorry, in, um, in northern Michigan, uh, this fen. And it's really been um, a place we thought really worth looking at because of this one species. It's uh, called Rosella coleochetis. And it's the only rosella that's known on something other than water molds. This is on the green alga coleochete, OK? And the only place it's ever been found is this, um, this fen. It's only been seen one time. And this is pretty much all the information we have about it. But, we, you know, and it, but it has a uniflagellate zoospore. We think it's probably in among this uh, dark matter. And it's, it's kind of been my Moby Dick since I've come to Michigan. We're constantly going up there trying to find it um, and looking at lots of Koleokiti and never, never seeing it. Um, but the sample, the, that Smith's fen has tons of, of cryptomycota and chytrids, for, as you might imagine, for such a cool habitat. And this is like up to 16% of our reads when we do eukaryotic sequencing come back as cryptomycota. So, and, and this is just showing some of the diversity of things we've found in Smith's Fen using those eukaryotic primers. Um, and everything in black is stuff we sequenced from Smith's Fen. And then these bars are like their relative abundance. Okay. And we targeted, so we're getting lots of cryptomycota here. And we targeted five cells, which are these red arrows here. This is the chytrid side. And we would be able to get something relatively close to high abundance OTUs there. And on this cryptomycota side, we have this one particular OTU, which we have a good genome of. And sadly, it's like not related to anything we've ever sequenced using this metabarcoding approach. But it happens to be the thing that went into a tube and amplified well. 
And it also happens to be related to this fungus, um, Mitosporidium daphne, which we know to be um, a gut parasite of daphne. Okay. So let's do chicken. So then um, Stephen and Doina sequence those, those um, five cells, and then we looked for these conserved genes, and we were able to easily place them onto the fungal tree, and they're the ones here in, in, uh, in teal. So here's our two cryptomycota, and then down here are our chytrids. Here's the coverage of the genome completeness using Segma, and you can see some of them are actually pretty low. As low as like 15%, and then we have some that are more like 60%. Okay, so it's really hard when you don't have the ability to do the co-assembly to get complete genomes. But we're very, it's very easy to put them into the tree. Gene counts really low, like extremely low for some of them. Um, now, we're still figuring out how to get function from these data. And you can imagine it's like, you know, there's a lot of gaps in the data because we only have 30% of the genome how can we infer, you know, what the function of this organism is? And we're still on our, we're still working on that. And um, if you take a very naive approach and just try to like cluster it based on the orthologous proteins you recover, you're not going to see anything meaningful because you're just missing so much data. Um, but if you know what to look for, you can actually get some things out of it. And this is just the one example that I'm going to go through, but it, it's, um, all these cryptomycota and microsporidia are stealing nucleotides and energy from their host. And they've done this by acquiring genes from mostly bacteria that allow them to import in um, nucleotides and ATP. And they can't actually do de novo nucleotide synthesis. And so um, what Chris Hittinger's lab has shown is that there's been multiple horizontal acquisitions of this gene thymidine kinase into this cryptomycota microsporidia clade. And, um, and it allows basically the fungus to, to, to um, take thymidine and turn it into DNA, basically. And, and so it's not found in other fungi, too, because they have different ways of making their DNA. So, Looking at our single cell genome from Smith's Fen and placing it in this tree of these thymidine kinases, we can see that um, it looks to be yet another horizontal acquisition, perhaps from chlamydia bacteria. And, uh, and so we know now that these guys also can't make their own DNA and they um, presumably are, are um, acquiring thymidine from their host. There are a lot of problems with the next steps, um, a lot of hurdles we still haven't crossed, um, but it's interesting for us to think about it, and I think there is a lot of promise when we're going and applying this throughout the fungal kingdom. One of the issues we have is um, not being able to visualize the cells that we're, we're sequencing. And there are ways of visualizing the cells. Um, this is this um, cool flow cytometer that takes pictures of organisms um, flow cam, and you get all these cool pictures, but you can't actually capture the cells. So we need a cell sorter that can also image, and perhaps there is one I don't know about, so if you know about one, please, please come talk to me. Um, another thing is we lose ecological context when we're just looking at spores, and that's mostly what we've been looking at. So here's a cryptomycotin um, that Mako Kagami's lab has, has found, and it's attached to this diatom. Okay, so we know in that case, oh, the host is a diatom. That's useful. And we probably are going to have to stop doing single organisms. We probably need to do, if we're going to look at cryptomycota, they're probably almost all parasites. We need host-associated genome sequencing. But a lot of fungi, most of them actually grow as hyphae, and so they're diff difficult to, to attack. And so um, we don't need to use methods like microdissection. Okay. And I think I'm, I'm running out of time. I don't want to go too, too over. Uh, so, but one thing our lab is doing is not scaling up, but actually scaling down. So I have this uh, student and postdoc, and they're trying to sequence genomes of these unculturable fungi that are the formal, former zygomycota. Um, they're predatory fungi. They're really interesting. They can't be cultured, but they go around and they um, eat rotifers, nematodes, and amoebae. 
okay? And our approach is basically to look for them in, in the substrate. So the, these guys are like plating out um, soil on water auger and letting the host grow out, and then they'll, they'll just pick them off and try to sequence them that way. We've been pretty successful with that approach. Um, and just one other piece of this, uh, of this genome space we can get is that um, we can often get en endosymbiotic bacteria, okay? And we, in this case, we found this bacterium that was um, in among our DNA sequence, and it turned out to be one that's known from these other zygomyce seat fungi. And it's still there three years later, so it seems to be close association. And we have the genome sequence of that, and we can look at the function of, of that bacterium. The last thing I'll just touch on real quickly is the other piece of the, um, the genome that we can take and use, which is um, leveraging the fact that we're sequencing multiple cells uh, and to look at the organization of the polymorphism that we observe. So you sequence the genome, you always get some kind of polymorphism. Um, and it could be that, you know, you have polymorphism between the cells that you're sequencing, or it could be polymorphism within the cells. But since we're actually, in this case, sequencing multiple cells of the same, you know, genotype, we can actually answer this question. Um, and I'm going to go through this quickly, but this really great grad student, um, in, in University of Ottawa, who also was working with us on the rosella genome, contacted me out of the blue and basically said that rosella that we had sequenced was triploid. And the data behind that are, are, ba are basically like this. You can use KMERS and allele frequencies. But when you have a triploid pattern and you have a polymorphic base, you know, two-thirds of them say one thing and a third say another thing. And then if you look at allele frequency spectrum, you can see something that looks like that, where of the polymorphic bases, you know, a lot of them have this, are found in one-third of the time, and the others are found two-thirds of the time. And, and the contrast is a haploid pattern, which has no peaks in the allele frequency spectrum, and the KMERS, um, you don't have peaks lower than genome coverage. Um, and, 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 and we're able to use the, the variation within these co-assemblies and also across the libraries. And so we found kind of like a threshold. You know, you're going to get a couple thousand dirty bases in your, you know, sequences. But when you, when you have real higher ploidy, you get, you know, so 10,000 or something shared SNPs. Uh, so looking across the libraries, we're able to see those, these are real SNPs. They're found in every cell that we look at. And, and this last slide is just, you know, it turns out, and this is like emerged from the last say, 12 years of sequencing at the JGI and, and looking at basal fungal lineages, that fungi actually evolved as diploids and were diploids for a long part of their evolution. So the diploid branches here are in, in, in blue. So basically all the chytrids and the blastocladia mycota and a lot of these zygomycetes are, are diploid fungi. So we have to kind of rewrite the textbook a little. Um, lessons learned, so we can use single cells to grow the fungal tree of life, and we've got a pipeline in place now, we're ready to go. We can easily turn this on, something that we can sort. So you can imagine these aquatic samples, no problem, spores we can trap out of the air, body fluids. The easiest thing is to put these things onto the tree, and the hardest thing is to actually infer their ecological function. Yeah, and I just said that about the, the diploidy. Um, so wanted to thank again um, the great colleagues at JGI, and it's been many, many fun discussions and trials and tribulations. Thanks to Igor, um, Tanya, and particularly Doina and Steven for driving this work. Um, thanks to Alicia Quant in, in my lab, who's now at Colorado. And Jason and Joey, who are collaborators on the um, Zygo Life project. So thanks. I don't know if I have time for questions, but. Yeah.